All right, folks, since we have a very packed agenda, I'm going to go ahead and get everything started. Uh, I'm really pleased to see so many people in the room. This is absolutely amazing. And I just want to start off by thanking each and every one of you for your time, your energy, and your attention today. It's absolutely vital. And I think the work that we're going to do today is going to serve us for years to come. So that's a really exciting proposition, a really ambitious agenda to set at the very beginning. But I think we have uh, the strength and I think we have the determination to make this happen. My name is Anthony. I am the leader of the Equals EU project, and that is a uh, multinational uh, capacity building project funded here by the EU, and that uh, combines uh, institutions all over the world. I'll get into a little bit more of that in a minute. I want to start by thanking a very special person. Uh, Tamara Dancheva is the one who has had the fortitude, the strength of leadership, and the integrity to put all of this together in such an effective way. And so I want to express my sincere gratitude to you, Tamara. We would not be here if it weren't for you. And I think that is a, an incredible undertaking and uh, an achievement. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much. I also want to do a little bit of shopkeeping. Uh, so for everybody's uh, benefit, this meeting is going to be live streamed. So we are going to be on YouTube. We are actually live on YouTube right now, which is super exciting. Uh, this is our first live streamed uh, project meeting. So this is a, a lot of fun for us. Uh, I also want to encourage everybody to please rename yourself in uh, Zoom with your first name and your last name. And this is just so we have an understanding for who's in the room who we're kind of working with today. Um, so just please, if you have a chance, go ahead and rename yourself. If you have any questions about how to do that, just throw in the chat, hey, help, I need uh, someone to, to give me some instructions and we'll give you uh, information about that. Uh, the meeting is also being recorded and it's being captioned, which reminds me that I and the other speakers will need to speak uh, with, at a measured pace so that the captioner can keep track of all the things that we're saying. Uh, if you have any questions during the session, I would really encourage you to throw them into the chat and we'll keep tabs on that and we'll just make sure that everybody gets their questions answered if, uh, if time allows. Now, I believe we have an agenda uh, that's available at some point, or at least we've circulated an agenda so everybody should know kind of what's happening and what's coming up. Uh, and so this is just the welcome, the uh, hello to everyone, and uh, thank you again for taking your time to be here. Just to speak a little bit about the Equals EU project, it's a really exciting capacity building project, and we're under the auspices of a much larger global network called the Equals uh, Partnership for Digital Gender Equality. And this is an absolutely fabulous piece of work that's being led by uh, organizations like GSMA and the United Nations uh, International Telecommunications Union and UN Women. If you want to know more about this, check out the, our website equals.org. Uh, and of course, you're also welcome to check out our website equals-eu.org and learn a little bit more about us. Equals EU is a gender uh, is a focus has a focus on gender inclusive innovation. And we work right at the grassroots. So we're not interested so much in working at a top-down approach, but much more a bottom-up approach. And we take seriously the activity of decentering people who are in positions of power and recentering attention and focus on people who are emerging. And that really amounts to uh, an opportunity to elevate new leaders in this field. So today we're going to have this colloquium. Uh, in a few months, we're going to be launching 24 hackathons in 24 different countries across the planet, uh, mostly focused in Europe, but also reaching out into Africa and Southeast Asia and Central Asia. Uh, in the coming years, we're going to be running an incubator program, a six-month online incubator program, and a leadership boot camp. And so this is really capacity building at the grassroots because we're able to bring in new and fresh perspectives on these issues and elevate them to become our future leaders. We have a core group of 19 partners, but we have a broader group of about 50 partners from across the planet. And so this is a great chance for you, if you represent an organization that may be interested in kind of aligning yourself with some of this work, it's a great chance for you to reach out to us. Again, our website is equals-eu.org. 
You can also follow us on all the social media channels where, uh, where our handles are more or less equals dash EU. And we also have a mailing list that you can uh, sign up for at our website, again, equals-eu.org. Uh, that kind of wraps it up for me. I want to introduce now our first speaker, who is someone I have an, an immense amount of admiration and respect for. Uh, she is a absolute superstar in this field, uh, someone who I've gotten the honor and privilege to have worked with for several years now, and who uh, has really paved the way, uh, not only for her and her generation, but the generations to come. So I believe we all owe her a, an immense debt of gratitude. Uh, she is Belinda Exelby. Uh, she is the head of international relationship relations at GSMA. She uh, is managing relationships with a lot of international intergovernmental organizations, which means her ability to keep an even keel and to moderate really difficult discussions is of the highest caliber. She also runs policy and regulatory trainings. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, I would encourage you to please check out the work that GSMA is doing. And she's also the chair of the steering committee of the Equals Global Partnership. So with that, I would love to turn it over now to Belinda. Belinda, thank you so much for being here and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Anthony, for those, those kind words and that very uh, uh, helpful introduction to the programs. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here with you all today and I feel very privileged to be addressing the meeting wearing the, the two hats that Anthony referred to, both uh, representing GSMA and as the current uh, chair of the steering committee of Equals. Um, as Anthony mentioned, Equals is the largest international platform which uh, brings together the public and the private sectors um, in order to uh, close the digital gender gap. And it was established back in 2016 by the ITU, GSMA, UN Women, UN University, and the International Trade Center. Um, within the, the framework of Equals, the topic of female leadership in the digital economy is one of our three main focus areas. So it's really wonderful to see the Equals Research Coalition, which is led jointly by Oslo Metropolitan University, uh, Anthony, and Georgia Tech, um, to see that they're undertaking such important work on this issue within the framework of the Equals EU project. So at a time when the COVID-19 pandemic threatens to reverse much of the progress made on gender equality, the work of Equals is more relevant than ever. The new UN report about COVID reveals that the social and economic cost of the pandemic will be paid disproportionately by the world's girls and women. This is suggested by the spike in loss of employment for women who hold the majority of insecure, informal and lower paying jobs, and the rapid increase in unpaid care work that girls and women mostly provide. So at its core, the Equals EU project aims to address such issues, as Anthony has said, by building capacity in gender inclusive innovation in Europe and in partner countries worldwide through its ambitious and value driven agenda. The project is structured around the impact area that Anthony mentioned to create smart, sustainable and inclusive innovation ecosystems by building capacity and expanding networks for women and girls in social innovation and entrepreneurship. The discussions today are going to form an important part of the project's success, as we, the GSMA, in partnership with 18 other Equals EU consortium members, begin to create a mobility programme for 24 leaders in gender equity and digital inclusion. We are very much looking forward to hosting an international summer school next year in 2022, which will consist of three one-week professional development boot camps. As a co-founder of Equals, GSMA has always had a very strong commitment to driving change on behalf of the mobile industry and seeing through the full realisation of women and girls in the digital space. The discussion today borrows its title from the first joint pilot study, which GSMA led in partnership with Oslo Met, EY and other Equals members late last year. Entitled Perceptions of Power, Championing Female Leadership in Tech, the pilot study was unique to the mobile and ICT industry. It has examined the ways in which men and women in middle and senior level management positions define leadership. The study had a particular focus on the gender differences in leadership perceptions, which was critical as the gender gap in leadership is affected by, among other factors, issues of perception of power. The report also presents a number of recommendations for concrete actions that both the public and private sectors can undertake to encourage the advancement of women among the digital economy's leadership ranks. My colleague uh, from GSMA, John Giusti, is going to share some of the report's recommendations later on today, 
But I do want to emphasize that the discussions we're having today are an important next step in this research work, and they will be reflected in a report that will be published at the end of this year. We're therefore delighted that as the Equals EU Consortium, we've been able to mobilize so many representatives today from across the mobile industry, civil society, academia, and the international development community. I'd like to thank each of the Equals EU Consortium members for their dedication to and support of the cause, in particular, Oslo Met University, the Institute of Economics of the Latvian Academy of Sciences, University Hospital Cologne, University of Haifa, the Middle East Technical University, and All Digital, who are all co-hosts for today's meeting. So with all that being said, we'll now turn to the main agenda for the day. And I would now like to welcome uh, Dr. Nina Linda, who will be chairing our panel discussion. Dr. Linda is the director of the Institute of Economics at the Latvian Academy of Sciences, and she has more than 15 years of research experience. She's an associate professor of economics and specializes in interdisciplinary research looking into the scientific contribution of innovation to the development of society. Dr. Linda is also the main organizer and host moderator of the annual International Economic Forum in the Latvian Academy of Sciences. Nina, thank you very much indeed for joining us today and over to you now for our panel discussion. Thank you very much, Belinda. Thank you very much, colleagues. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I'm really very pleased to open a plenary session that is very significant for the development of our project and for the entire European space on the topic perception of power, championing female leadership in the digital age. The main goal of our plenary discussion is to share best practice, expertise, knowledge, and life experience in order to find solution and recommendation on how to motivate or increase the participation of women in our digital technological world, as well as in management position. As a result of the great realization of women's potential, the whole society wins. Today, we will have a unique opportunity to meet four experts, four panelists, panelists who have achieved significant results in the development of women's leadership, motivation and involvement of women in the world of technology and management, in the organization of international projects and initiative. Our expert today, these are two women and two men from different countries and continents, from Europe, Africa, and Asia. I am sure that this international event and global vision will give us new food for thought, important recommendation, new ideas, and in the long term, I'm very hope, will give more courage for our women to be actively involved in the world of information technology and leadership. Why actually this topic is so important? Let's take a look at the latest up-to-date statistics. According to Eurostat statistics, there is still a significant gap in female digital leadership across all European countries. The proportion of female ICT specialists ranges from 27-25% in Bulgaria and Serbia, as we can see, to only 12-10% in the Czech Republic, Malta, and Hungary. In the next slide, please. This is the global statistic for this 2021, which show the percentage of women and men around the world in management positions. As we can see, women are more actively involved in leadership and management in academic positions, in education and health, than in technical fields like fintech, startup, health tech, and others. Those in today's uh, uh, digital age, we are faced with these challenges of inequality. Therefore, dear colleagues, we invite you, together with our international and excellent experts in a general discussion, to seek answer to the following question. Please, next slide. What is the current state of the digital leadership gap in Europe and across the Eastern Partnership? 
I already actually have uh, touched on this issue a little bit. What obstacles do rising female leaders in the digital econo economy face? Why actually does championing female leadership in tech matter? How can a more inclusive tech industry be fostered in which diverse leadership style are welcome? I know that in our virtual colloquium seminar today brought together more than 80 participants, the smartest women and men from various fields and countries. You also are welcome to take an active part in the discussion, ask a question to our panelists, or express your own uh, opinion or share your experience. To do this, we invite you to use the chat here or raise your hand in live stream. So your suggestion, feedback, opinions will be very important for elaborate, uh, elaboration, conclusion, and re recommendation, which will be reflected in the final report for the European Commission. So we will be grateful for your proactiveness. However, we must uh, adhere to our schedule and time limit. Therefore, I kindly ask uh, the panelists to present your vision uh, within two, no more than seven, eight minutes, but our participant to give compact questions. And I apologize in advance if we will not have time to answer all your questions, but we will try our best. So dear colleagues, I am pleased to introduce our first expert, our first panelist from Malaysia, Ms. Nur Sulina Abdullah. Ms. Sulina is the chief of the D Digital Knowledge Hub develop, uh, Department at the Telecommunication Development Bureau of the International Te Telecommunication Union in Malaysia. Prior to this current position, Sulina worked uh, for nearly two decades at the Communications and Multimedia Commission of Malaysia was the director of uh, corporate strategy for this commission and was also the director of transformation and previously the director of internet economics. Uh, Ms. Sulina uh, also has experience in the private sector during which time she took uh, up a position at Netflix as director of public policy of Southeast Asia. Throughout her career, Sulina has represented Malaysia in the best way in various positions at the international arena. Sulina is a lawyer by training and is an advocate of the Malaysian bar. So dear Sulina, you are woman leader, you are woman manager, woman entrepreneur. You have started and made your career in the field of telecommunication and internet economy in the Asia Pacific and environment pri uh, primary actually dominated by men. So my question is, what were the biggest obstacles or biggest challenges for you during your career and how did you actually overcome them? Thank you for the question, Nina. It's a, it's a very generous question, but first of all, bonjour from Geneva. <laughs> I'm actually based in Geneva now in the ITU. Um, so back to your question, we all know that the telecommunications slash ICT slash digital sector is a fast moving and dynamic one. And um, to be able to lead in this field, one of the biggest challenges I find is to constantly keep abreast of all the developments. It's a Herculean task, but uh, we've got to start somewhere and you've just got to try. So when I started out, I realized that I had to read a lot to keep up with the pace and as you mentioned, I was with the Malaysian Communications and Multimedia Commission for 20 years. So before joining MCMC, I had done some work for the incumbent, but on the public affairs side. So competition, access, universal service, licensing, spectrum, I had to get into all that in a lot more detail. So I worked at it and I tried to learn as much as I could on spectrum, for instance. You know, well, as much as a lawyer can try to understand about spectrum without being an engineer, so it's important to come well prepared to the negotiating table, especially if you're one of the few women there and need to have your voice heard. Knowledge, I believe, will give you a voice. But more than that, it's about how you apply that knowledge. Application is everything. 
So when I'm asked for advice or tips, what I tend to say, including to young women who are just starting out, is to read. Read, just read. Get a lay of the land so that you can understand the gaps, have the requisite knowledge to do your work and find opportunities to contribute. So I've been doing this for a long time, even now. And the one thing I do is to carve out time to read every day if possible. And you know, you know as well as I do that you'll never be done with your reading. So I believe that by staying well informed, women can gain confidence in their knowledge and their ability to participate and lead change in the field. And this is where having mentors and female role models can help. So the second chair of MCMC who remains the only woman who has held that position is one of my mentors. She used to say to me, don't let anyone trample on you. The way to avoid that is to be prepared and know what you're talking about. So there's only so much you can do with a little bit of knowledge. And she's right. So that's been my motivating factor for the past two decades. At the ITU, we um, recently launched a support network for women delegates, the network of women, or now as we call it, in the ITU development sector. The network was set up to boost women's leadership in the sector. Its objective is to increase the number of women participating in meetings and taking up leadership roles, chairing committees, for instance, or working groups. The network also has a mentorship component through which more experienced professionals are matched up with women who have more recently entered the field to guide and to mentor them. So I know from experience, personal experience, that such a community of women can do wonders just in terms of creating a mind shift and breaking boundaries that some women never knew were there. So in 2002 or three, Malaysia hosted a gender conference and ITU was one of the partners. I knew of course that there were women leaders in the ICT sector, but seeing them in action, how talented and knowledgeable these women for, from all over the world were, well, that showed me that there really are opportunities for women globally. So another challenge, and this may sound cliche, is managing your professional and personal life. I know it's a way of life for everyone, but it's still a challenge. A bit more if you're in a leadership position. In many instances, it's not easy, but it's possible to do everything you need to do. Well, um, well, almost possible. Many women leaders have raised children along the way, for example. And I, as I just said, that's a way of life. You know, from halfway across the world, I've had to deal with science projects, missing school books, badminton records, and the odd basketball shoe gone MIA, you name it, you know but you just manage and you will find that equilibrium between your personal and professional life. So we definitely need more female role models, but I've been very fortunate, Nina, to have had both men and women mentors. I certainly have had great supportive mentors for men and my previous chairman, Dr. Halim and ministers whom I've served and guided me along the way have been such mentors. They are part of the equation in achieving gender equality. And I'm glad that there are men here today who are part of the conversation. So Nina, one of your questions was, how, why does championing female leadership in tech matter? So I strongly believe in women, uh, women leadership in the tech sector. Technology has such an influence on everything today, which is why it's important to try our best to ensure that how technology is shaped and used is managed for the benefit of all. And for this to happen, women have to be able to contribute, share their perspectives, participate in decision-making, so as the UN Secretary General said upon taking oath for his second term, women need to have an equal role in designing digital technologies. And it's not just about how technology is evolving or developed, it's also about managing how technology is used, policy development, protecting users. We need different perspectives for all this, including from women. And we need to work together, harness the power of partnership, pull all the stops to ensure that women and girls are inspired and empowered to take the place as equal leaders in today's global digital transformation. And that's why women leadership in tech matters. We need to continue championing that. So again, I'm glad that there are women, uh, there are men here today. And um, I'd like to make a quick shout out to my husband whose support I can always count on in my professional life. Thank you, Nina, back to you. Thank you very much, dear uh, Solina. Yeah, you gave a lot of wise advices for our and women and I, I hope the young generation will follow your example uh, very positive dear colleagues and let me introduce uh, you our next panelist this time a man who also made an incredible and interesting career 
Mr. John Giusti is head of advocacy and chief regulator of officer at Global System for Mobile Communication Association, GSMA, from the United Kingdom of Great Britain. Mr. Giusti was educated in the United States with a Juris Doctor from Boston University School of Law and a Bachelor of Science in Telecommunication uh, from the University of Florida. Mr. John Giusti spent 17 years at the United States Federal Communication Commission. He served as Chief of Staff and Senior Policy Advisor to Commissioner Michael Copps, where he uh, provided legal, strategic, and poli policy support to the com com uh, commissioner on all major uh, agency action, including the implementation of the National Broadband Plan. So today, as Chief Regulator Officer for the GSMA, John Giusti is responsible for leading the organization public policy and industry advocacy agenda with governments, regulators, and international institutions worldwide. So welcome, dear Mr. Giusti. Taking, and uh, my question would be uh, uh, regarding your uh, quote, taking uh, your all, own position in the GSMA, you had said, Mobile is one of the most exciting and dynamic industry sector today, one that has already had a tra transformative impact on the lives of billions of people around the world, and that makes major contribution to the global economy. So, Mr. Giusti, what value do you think female leadership and increased participation of female specialists can bring to the development of the mobile industry? Well, th thank you. Thank you so much for the kind words and thank you for having me here today. Um, and I think it's a very crucial question that you ask because I think how well we respond to that challenge will be, I feel, very important to the future of the mobile industry uh, that we at GSMA represent. Um, so first, let me say, though, I, I, you know, I, you know, I very much agree with some of the key points that Selena raised, and I think working current, you know, working in, formally in Malaysia and now at the ITU, really that importance of working together with governments, with industry, is going to be really important as we try to close the digital gender gap. Um, and I think that's one of the main reasons that we at GSMA partnered with the ITU, with you and women, with the ITC and you and university five years ago. Uh, to jointly establish the Equals Global Partnership uh, for Gender Equality. Um, I think that's why we decided to join the Equals EU Consortium Project as well as one of its 19 members. And I think it's, it's one of the reasons we're partnering in today's event because this digital gender gap is really a major concern and it's a major concern for the digital and mobile sector. And, you know, obviously this is a development issue, but it's not just a development issue. This is an issue that impacts the bottom line. And I think that we should not lose sight of the fact that, uh, you know, that the lack of female leadership and that this gender digital divide really does have significant impact in terms of revenue loss, uh, reduction in market scale and workforce. So it's not just the right thing to do to address, it's also the profitable thing to do. So for those who might not listen to the right thing to do, let's also focus on what they can do to improve the economics. Um, and at the GSMA, obviously, we have, a, we have a number of platforms and we engage across the industry globally. And we think it's very important for us to try to use that platform to advance gender equality and, and otherwise contribute to society and to try to lead by example. And that's why we've worked with the mobile industry as a whole. And we were the first sector as a whole actually to commit to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And obviously, a key part of that is the commitment to SDG 5 um, on gender equality. Um, so we, we further strengthen that as well by uh, signing the UN Women's uh, Empowerment Principles. And again, this links back to that business case for corporate action and promoting gender equality and women's empowerment. Um, as I mentioned, there's real economic and talent benefits that come from increasing female leadership and representation in ICT. Um, and in fact, I think many of our members are already trying to do what they can to lead by example, taking concrete action. And hopefully, I think also challenging each other to do better. Uh, just a few months ago, AT&T in the US was again named to the Bloomberg Gender Equality Index for the third year in a row. Orange, another member, 
uh, with operations across Europe, Africa, and the Middle East has reaffirmed its commitment to greater female representation in technical roles across its operations. And just this past fall, Alison Kirkby, the CEO of another member, Telia Company, was recognized as one of the 28 most powerful women in the world by Forbes magazine. So again, it's these sort of true leadership and action we need to try to continue to demonstrate and also challenge. Um, in addition to working with our members, of course, at GSMA, we do want to also look internally. And we have recently adopted a four-point action plan, uh, a broader action plan on diversity and inclusion that aims to reduce um, inequalities amongst underrepresented talent. Now, I, I recently had the, uh, the chance to participate in the W20 Summit in Rome, which was hosted by the Italian presidency. Um, and I think it was clear increasingly that industry, or at least some in industry, are moving beyond reacting to government policies and mandates to trying to demonstrate their own leadership and the benefits of a more inclusive uh, business environment. Um, and, you know, I really do think that there is a duty on us in the digital sector um, to try to do what we can to show leadership, because we always talk about the future being digital, and we all know that an estimated 90% of future jobs will require digital skills. So clearly, we're <laughs> knocking things over in the office. Um, so we clearly do have, uh, you know, we, we do have a long way to go. I think we saw some of the stats that you mentioned up front. Um, and globally, in 2019, women held just 29% of senior roles and 20% of board director seats. Today, we know that women are only 7.8% of CEOs in Fortune 500 companies. And I think it's also worth noting that only three of those 39 women are women of color. So, um, you know, and I think, uh, you know, Belinda actually mentioned up front, the disproportionate impact that the COVID-19 pandemic has taken on women and people of color in particular, we cannot lose sight of. Uh, just over the past year, we know that women across major economies were 24% more likely to lose their jobs than men. Um, and if this persists, global GDP could suffer a one trillion US dollar loss by 2030 if nothing's done. So I think it's very important that as we, as we look to tackle this, that we think about the role that leadership teams within industry uh, have and how they properly reflect the diversity of the communities from which they come is gonna be so uh, important to ensuring the sustainability of business. Um, I think all of us here recognize this, this has to be not just a tick the box exercise. This has to be about a true empowerment, empowerment to thrive in whatever role or position um, a woman um, holds within a company, and really anyone holds within a company, and the broader mobile ecosystem um, is really um, going to need to be taking this, taking this challenge to heart. Um, we actually recently successfully hosted, somewhat miraculously in, in the current environment, our Mobile World Congress Barcelona, where we did have a GSMA Diversity for Tech Summit. And I think one could really palpably feel there this shift from just awareness to the need for action. And you could see more demonstrable elements of action. So I think that's something, hopefully in today's discussion, we can look at how to keep these actions moving forward. Um, and I think there's also, I think importantly, we, you know, we, we, we have to be careful not to just focus at the top because I think it's important what happens at the top. But throughout an organization, it can't just be whether there's enough diversity on the board or in senior positions. I mean, it's important for sure, and it has broader impacts. But it's also important for development and to understand whether people, whatever their positions in the organization, feel empowered and supported to progress their careers. Um, that's why GSMA partnered with EY and Oslo Metropolitan University, along with other equal partners, to do a pilot study that undertook the task of quantifying the differences between men's and women's perceptions of leadership attributes and behaviors across the mobile and tech industries. This study, um, the perception of power, championing female leadership in tech, um, which I think is in part inspired some of today's discussion, um, found that women's and men's perceptions of themselves and leadership differ. I mean, I know that's not totally surprising, but it was good to start trying to quantify, have real data on what's going on out there. And while men um, appear to identify more as hands-off leaders, women identified more as what we would call transformational uh, leaders. So with 58% of women really very strongly specifying the importance of purpose in what they do. So they perceive themselves as concerned with others' abilities and desires to succeed uh, within an organization to a greater extent than men. Um, and I think we all know that prior research has shown that transformational leadership can prove a powerfully effective approach in, in many cases. Um, so I won't go into the details of all, this, all the study, of course, but I do wanna give a, a, uh, an indication of the 
recommendations in four key areas that are included. These are aimed at fostering best practice for promoting and retaining women in leadership positions in the mobile and tech industries. And these are, one is I think really acknowledging um, the range of transformational leadership styles and what they bring. Um, two would be providing incentives to individuals to develop effective leadership skills. Three is, um, and we've heard a little bit about this from Selena, is the importance of mentorship and mentorship and training. And lastly is of course, increasing research into and spreading awareness of factors that affect leadership equity and fairness. So there's a lot more to see in that report and I would encourage um, everyone here to look, look at it. Um, but I really think that understanding the self perceptions of female and male leaders is going to be important as we try to move beyond targets to ensuring that women in leadership positions feel truly empowered in their roles and therefore bring the maximum benefits of their unique skills, of their experiences uh, to the discussion and to the table. And just uh, lastly, just to, to finish up, uh, for our sector, I think we, we, we need to also look not just at our own companies, at our own organizations, we also have to look at our users. And I think closing the gender gap um, in usage is something we cannot lose sight of. Over the past decade, we have had a program called Connected Women that aims to accelerate digital and financial inclusion in lower and middle income countries. Now we've already reached 39 million women through this work, but there are millions, hundreds of millions more that we need to, need to reach. And mobile phones we really can be a lifeline for women, uh, both economically and socially, um, providing them with critical information, services, and um, I think that understanding that gap as well is going to be important, particularly as we try to respond to the implications of COVID. So I would direct um, everyone to also to our mobile gender gap report, which will have more details on, on some of those um, areas. But in conclusion, I just wanna say that, you know, GSMA, um, we are very much committed to action. Um, we do have a lot more work to do, we know that. Um, and I think hopefully insights and discussions like those today and the EU's, the uh, Equals EU project will help better inform what we do both within GSMA and also I think importantly, and more importantly probably, with our 750 members across the world. So thank you so much for allowing me to participate today and uh, I look forward to more of the discussion. Thank you very much, Mr. Justi. I know that you and your GSMA was able to involve powerful and wonderful women in your organization. And thank you for expertise and important points what you give us for discussion. I, I'm sure will be questioned later, but now we are moving forward and it's a really great honor for me to introduce our next panelist, the leader of our project, without whom actually our meeting and our project would not have had a place at all. Dr. Anthony Janomis is Associate Professor of Universal um, Design of ICT as a Department of Computer Science at Oslo Metropolitan University in Norway. Dr. Anthony is an internationally recognized expert in universal design of information and communication technology. He leads several large-scale research and innovation projects based in over 27 countries. Dr. Anthony works with the United Nations International Telecommunication Unions at, as the vice reporter for the subcommittee on ICT accessibility and research coalition lead for the Equal Global Network. Anthony is founder and chair of the board for the Global Universal Design Commission Europe AS. He is a member of the board for many laboratories, the Global Universal Design Commission, Inclusive IT and Human for Humans. Since 2014, Anthony has acted as a principal investigator for research and innovation project with budget total over 11 million euros. Anthony has taught over 3,000 students and mentored over 23 startups. And this is only a small part of the biography of Anthony's achievements. <laughs> we are really delighted to have the opportunity to collaborate, to learn from Anthony. Anthony, it's your floor. You have uh, mentored over 23 startups so far half of which have been led by women. And in your opinion, Anthony, what are the main differences between female and male leadership styles? 
Mm. What can men learn from women in honing a more effective leadership style, particularly in the tech and innovation field? Thank you, Nina. And I'm absolutely humbled by that introduction. My goodness. Um, I, I was just reflecting on this because I, I think what John mentioned in the report is really important in terms of providing a, a set of data that supports some of our intuition and maybe some of the anecdotal experiences that a lot of us probably share. I was lucky to be a PI on that project, so I was one of the principal investigators. But what I, I really want to talk about is what it means to me as a professional to have a woman leading a startup or in one of my jobs as associate professor at Oslo Metropolitan University, my direct supervisor is a woman and she's the head of the computer science department. So I'm really, really lucky to have had the opportunity to serve under some absolutely just rock star individuals who have really taken the work that we want to do, championed it, taken it forward, and I've gotten to learn so much being under their supervision and being under their mentorship. I would say uh, th there's something in this that I think is really important for us to draw out, and that is that I, as a man, and I think men, all of us, have a lot of benefits that can be gained from having women in leadership positions. Um, and I think that means that we benefit from feminism, we benefit from gender equality. And I don't know that that's always put into the front of everybody's attention. Um, it, this is not a women's issue, this is a human issue. And I think there's so much value for men to get out of gender equality because we're all kind of suffering under these same patriarchal values, the same misogynistic values that put pressure on men and put uh, different uh, expectations on men. We can all kind of unburden ourselves by champion, championing gender equality. So I'd say the number one thing that I've gotten out of working under a, 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 working with a woman as a supervisor is a clear vision on how we can move forward. And I think this is so valuable for me as an employee because I can look to this person and, uh, and understand very clearly this is the direction we are going. Uh, I've always had this experience where uh, the women I've worked with have set a very clear agenda, very clear focus, and not just a goal. I think there's really important here to differentiate a goal from a purpose. The women I've gotten to work with, they don't just set goals. Okay, we want to do this by the end of the year. We want to do this by the end of the quarter. They set in your mind a sense of purpose that you can take to any activity that you do within that organization. And that kind of animates and fuels your ambitions and your desires to do great things. So I think that's number one, vision. Number two is this idea of hands-on mentorship. I think this is so undervalued in our workplace. And I've worked for men, I've worked for women, but I've never seen uh, more care taken, more direct interest taken than by the women I've gotten to work with in my own personal growth and development. And that is incredibly satisfying as an employee, especially when I was a junior academic coming into this new university, not really knowing what I'm gonna do, how I'm gonna do it to have somebody with the strength of character to say, not only we're going in this direction, let's all get there, but also to have that individualized attention, support, autonomy, to really understand how to make that happen. Now, I'm not talking about micromanaging here. It's really important that we differentiate micromanagement from hands-on mentorship. Uh, and hands-on mentorship is also not macro-managing either. It's somewhere in between where an employee feels supported, feels cared for, and feels uh, 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 like they have some autonomy, but that sense of supported autonomy. Um, now, of course, this is not a universal truth. I'm not going to you know, make a blanket statement that all women supervisors have, are like this, but I will say that the women who have supervised me have uh, all taken this uh, character, and I've benefited immensely from their leadership. Uh, I want to take us really quick now to kind of a, a different context, a different social context, because the work that I've done has primarily been under uh, supervisors in the global north, and there's a different frame of reference in the global south, and there's a real uh, paucity, there's a real lack of knowledge and understanding for what these different contexts bring to the table, whether that's a cultural context, social context, economic context. 
And it also involves this issue, uh, this concept of intersectionality and understanding a little bit better what are the intersectional uh, uh, issues that are at stake here for people who hold intersectional identities. So I think that uh, like a good academic, I'm gonna say, we really need more knowledge in this space. We need more validated data that can showcase how the different leadership styles are, are playing out. And especially when it comes to uh, knowledge uh, in the global South, we just absolutely need more investment because the future of innovation is intersectional. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, wonderful speech, and really, thank you. Um, thank you for inspiration. So women have very high responsibility to <laughs> to go on with such good words you you mentioned, and thank you for advice and concrete points what we can also use for our conclusion session. So, dear colleagues, uh, I am uh, happy to introduce our last panelist is a female leader in ICT sector from Kenya, Ms. Merci Ndiu. Merci Ndiu is the founder and CEO of Botlan, Bot Botlab, a company that provides bespoke training in data science and cybersecurity to boards, small media enterprises and the tech community. Ms. Mercy has a bachelor degree in business and technology as well as a, an MBA from Africa, Nazarene University. She is trained in general data protection regulation, GDPR, by University of Groningen in the Netherlands and is certified MBA cloud professional, as well as a graduate of the data science for business leader program uh, by Data Incubator Chicago. Ms. Mercy leads the Nairobi chapter of Women in Data, an organization that supports women exploring careers in data, data science. Mercy founded BotLab with the mission to highlight the power of technology in order to increase the uptake of technology use in Kenya, advocating for data science as a grow tool and cybersecurity as a risk mitigation tool. Mercy's company, BotLab, has trained over 4,000 professionals. So another woman leader, dear Miss Mercy, thank you for joining us. You are founder, founder of BotLab a software accelerator based in Kenya that conducts bespoke executive training in data science and cybersecurity to business leaders. So my question to you, what do you think, therefore, is the most effective solution in closing the digital skill gap and elevating women in leadership position in across the ICT sector? Thank you so much, Dr. Nina. Uh, also for the introduction. Uh, thank you for everyone who has attended. To answer your question, I would say there are a couple of things maybe that I would want to highlight. One of them, especially under digital, is to making sure that the knowledge of that the knowledge is understandable and that the consumers who you're targeting can um, consume it. Because it is one thing to articulate that this is the training you want to uh, maybe train. But it's another thing that someone can be able to have the knowledge that you want them to have and actually implement. What I've seen, especially in the digital space happening is um, the metrics that are used to measure the, sometimes the knowledge that is being carried down. You will find people attending the training because of the brands of people who are behind the program, but immediately after the session, there is very little translation between the knowledge that has been um, taught vis-a-vis -vis the impact. So sometimes it becomes very difficult for people to actually uh, consume the knowledge that you want your target audience to have. So if you are to train or if you want to give a certain uh, knowledge to people about digital skills, it is important that the donor needs are articulated, the industry needs are articulated, and also the recipient needs are articulated in such a way that they can actually see the benefit of um, 
them taking in the program. I've seen instances where we have been partners of a session for youth, a young women, and the key to them was employability. So if the training did not have an employability component, most of them do not want to attend. When it's uh, SME based for small businesses, when they do not see value in terms of how do I make money out of this or how does this help me make money out of this? They will attend, yes, but the uptick of what you are trying to teach, literally, you are unable to measure. Then about women in leadership, what I've seen, especially for me when I started out four years ago, it was very difficult even to convince uh, women in tech to actually even mentor me. So what I realized what happened for me was there were so many men around me that I decided to ask a specific asks. I have a problem in this or I have a challenge in this. Uh, is there a way you can be able to help? And progressively, I've been able even to enter circles where there are women and women are not easily trusting. They need some time uh, before they can warm up to someone. And what I've seen is that different versions of mentorship. I have seen versions where it's formal, where it's just we meet, we talk, we hear your problems, we advise you, we move on. But what I've seen work for me is literally mentorship where someone handholds you. So, for example, when I was starting out um, on some of the some of the integrations, because we are currently doing mobile money payments um, integration. So what I what I've seen to be a benefit is a lady will handhold me literally handhold me. They will show you suppliers to talk to, and if you have challenges, they will use their credibility to help you access supplies. Sometimes it will be financing, they will talk to banks or even loan you money uh, to be able to actually get um, work done. Sometimes it's labor, they can easily get in into getting their own talent pool or their own employees help you to show you what needs to be done and at what uh, level of standards. For me, that is one of, one of the biggest things that I've seen in mentorship circles work, right? As compared to the formulative where it's mentorship, but it does not have a big backing, especially when someone is starting out. So I will say when it comes to the advancing women in leadership, it has to be from the heart. Uh, where those people who want to mentor, it is actually in their best interest. And the ones who want to be mentored have to be ready to do the work. Uh, and they have to give themselves to do the work because sometimes there's that misalignment where one party overgives or is ready, but the other one uh, is not able to. Thank you, Dr. Nina. Uh, thank you, thank you, dear Mercy. I can feel your feminine leadership style <laughs> towards your work and business. It's so nice. <laughs> thank you for thank your. You. Uh, yes, it's very a good idea actually to consume knowledge uh, correct and functional way. How to get benefit? Yes, for it. It's really a very uh, good idea. Thank you for highlighting. In conclusion, uh, dear colleagues, I would like to, you see, we have wonderful speakers and uh, I don't want to let him go, <laughs> sorry. I would like to ask some general question to all our panelists, just in, in two words. What is one key commitment that you can undertake to change the state in play in your industry, in your sector over the next minutes, but also 10 years? <laughs> next 10 minutes, uh, but also 10 years. So please feel free, who is... Uh... <laughs> Dr. Linda, I'll, I'll be happy to get us started here. I think in the next 10 minutes, uh, I, I will commit to uh, getting on uh, social media, which I don't do often enough, and getting trying to continue to disseminate our messages that we're putting out uh, through Equals EU. Uh, so again, our, uh, our handle on most social media platforms is equals-eu. Um, you can also use the hashtag equals-eu. And if anybody out there is willing to uh, put out some messages for us, then I would love to uh, follow you and uh, so that we can continue this work together. 
On a more strategic level, uh, I think the next step is really for this project in particular is to start establishing a pipeline that exists outside of formal education spaces that continues to elevate the most marginalized groups. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you for your commitment. So, who next? Probably uh, Nisa. I'm happy to go Nina. next. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll start with the next 10 years first, uh, Nina. So from where I sit today, the key commitment that I can make is to promote gender inclusivity through the mainstreaming of gender policies. It's because mm -hmm. ITU has a diverse membership that consists of member states, the private sector and academia, and we are more fortunate in that respect compared to other UN agencies as we are uniquely positioned to drive a much needed multi-stakeholder approach to gender mainstreaming. So while working with governments who set the standards and policies to ensure that gender is considered from multiple and wide ranging aspects, we simultaneously work with the private sector who is well placed to make on the ground impact. And we've seen the private sector come forward during this pandemic to deliver connectivity and digital skills to communities who need them. And we need more similar initiatives that focus on digital skills for girls and women to make an impact and bridge the gender digital divide. IT is already doing this. Uh, I mentioned the Network of Women um, movement earlier. And of course, we are all gathered here today through the Equals Global Partnership. We also have the Girls Can Code initiative, Girls in ICT Day, and we have the Global Mentorship Program for Women in Cybersecurity to enhance women's le uh, leadership in that area. So in the next 10 minutes though, that's a bit more tricky. In the next 10 minutes, I commit to pinging my colleague Roshni, and I hope she's listening, to continue with our knowledge uh, sharing sessions for at least 90 minutes tomorrow. Mm. Uh, where's Roshni? Anyway, thank you, Nina. Back to you. <laughs> thank you. Very functional <laughs> approach. <laughs> thank you. So please, uh, Mr. Uh, John and Justin. Yeah, no, thanks. Well, I mean, just in terms of, of immediate action, and I always think we both need to be doing what we can immediately, not waiting till tomorrow. So engaging Tamara and Belinda, um, uh, my colleagues from GSMA, just to see what we can take away from today's discussion, to sort of tweak, look at what we are doing, both internally and through Equals and others. But I think in terms of longer, I think Selena mentioned the important work that Equals is doing on a number of fronts. But one I would like to just call out is sort of the longer term, and five-year commitment uh, we've partnered with the International Telecommunication Union, uh, one of the co-founders with us of Equals, as well as some of the Equals members, EY and Women's World Wide Web. And we have pledged to um, design and provide access to free training and e-mentoring for one million women by 2026 um, through um, something called Her Digital Skills Initiative. So again, I mean, it's, um, it is a step. Uh, there's always more to do, but I think as long as we can keep partnering and finding the right um, parties to come together and try to expand opportunities for women. The more women that get into STEM, get into STEAM, who come through the channels, the easier this work will be. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely agree with you. So uh, the, please, uh, Miss uh, Merci, and also your <laughs> vision in 10 minutes and in 10 years. <laughs> uh, in 10 minutes, first of all, is to say that I have collected a lot of information from this session, so I will incorporate it in how we work. Uh, in the next 10 years, um, I was one of the beneficiaries of the Equals program as an Equals Fellow. And one of the things that I purposed was to also keep holding other women who are in the space, who want to come into the space, and to also give um, back to the young women who are in college, because sometimes that's where we lose them uh, into STEM. And also buying and committing that every door that opens to me, that I will look for other women in the space to go through the door that I walk through. Because that is the only way, especially for women in STEM and who are also running businesses to keep um, the gender divide uh, going up. Because I can tell you for a fact, in most places, we are usually the only contractor. So it would be nice if it could be three, it could be five, if it could be 10 um, out of 100. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you, dear Mercy. Yeah, you, you will be the best example for inspiration, <laughs> young women, <laughs> to join ICT sector. Thank you, dear panelists, great comments, great ideas. Uh, we can feel a leadership approach, a responsible approach. The more we will have such personalities as you, the better our world will be. <laughs> and now I would like to um, 
has, uh, I would like actually to to give uh, uh, a next. Uh, I don't know if we have time for a question and answer. Uh, I would like also give a little bit uh, time for our participants to uh, make some question to our panelists before they are so uh, leaving our session. So do we have uh, any question? So from uh, Bani uh, to everyone, I agree that you mentioned that the mentorship is very so just a moment, I can open, yes. It's very important point, not only for women in tech, but also for diversity. As a Women in Technology Association, we are focusing on mentorship too. Thank you for your comment. You're welcome, Irina. <laughs> Thank you for your, uh, all the presentation. And I would like to uh, introduce myself. Uh, I am a, a accredited mentor uh, and I am from uh, Association of uh, Technology in uh, Women and all EMC. I am accredited mentor in EMCC Global. I am a member also and uh, have to nice to see all comments about mentorship. It's very important for the future. Thank you again. Thank you. Yes, please feel free to raise your hand or pop a question in our chat. Um, so from uh, Roshni, Ryan, to everyone, very much looking forward and always grateful for the session and learning. Uh, Sulina, thank you very much. Uh, we have a mentoring club for, for female cadets. Uh, it's very important issue for defense and security sector. Thank you. Great quote from Anthony, the future of innovation is intersectional. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank Michael, that was a key need as we saw in the programs we are leading in the No Vartis Foundation, but also why the inclusive and affordable mentoring at tech startup, Manity Mentor was founded. Yes, thank you. Um, a lot of uh, great words, uh, thank you very much, uh, and agreements uh, to our panelists' statements. We need to consider mentorship across borders and geographic borders, a foundational success element to any efforts. Thank you. So I feel so many of the speakers to talk about mentorship. It's the best kept secret of professional growth and equal opportunities. Nowadays, remote mentorship is especially re relevant for women uh, from low income setting who do not, don't have the access, the financial means or even opportunity to travel. Much to be shared on that given the sustainable lack of mentoring program in the health sector. Thank you for your comment. So do we have, uh, yes, uh, Arif, uh, uh, dear Arif Zaman raised the hand, please. Thank you very much. Yes, I just wanted to um, um, come in, if I may, just to ask a question. So my name is Arif Zaman. Um, I sit on the board of the Commonwealth Business Women's Network. We work closely with GSMA. My question is really around the anchoring this discussion this morning in the emerging tech space. Um, I mean, we know that there are areas, you mentioned ed tech, health tech, fashion tech, um, fintech and others. And my question is, as these areas are evolving, and they're clearly at an early stage in their evolution, what specific opportunities might there be for the discussion we're having this morning? I think we need to make the link between this discussion today around the issues we're highlighting and these emerging tech spaces. We produced a report for the G7, which GSMA were also part of that process, where we highlighted the importance of joining the dots between the emerging tech spaces and the digital gender divide. So I'd be very interested in people's reactions and responses to that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, opinion and comment. So do we have another uh, uh, participants? Uh, 
who would like probably to make some comments or questions? Uh, Nina, I could respond to Ari's yes, uh, yes, question because I think it's a really insightful question trying to stay on that leading edge of where technology will go next. And one of the things, uh, I'm actually not a computer scientist, I'm a social scientist. So one of the things I studied uh, for many years is trying to understand uh, how value systems inform our judgments and decisions. And I think if we can start shaping fundamental core values around equality, around what gender identity is on a global scale, that can have the most lasting benefits and it becomes embedded in all of the technology we create. And then the value systems kind of shape how that technology is presented, which in turn shape in a positive direction our values. So it's this reciprocal relationship between technology and society. Now that's a much easier <laughs> thing to describe than it is to do. Uh, but then, you know, a lot of this goes back to the way we create our laws, the who's in these uh, chambers, uh, and then how these laws are being put into practice. So I guess complicated answer for a complicated question. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony, for answering the question. So uh, we have another raising hand of uh, DG. And please, uh, uh, yes, Dorothy Gordon, thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, my name is Dorothy Gordon. I've been working in digital and innovation um, for a couple of decades. And I'm often invited to speak on gender issues. And I'm very concerned that we have these, similar to today, very safe places where everybody on this call is already committed to this. And then we talk about a lot of projects and collaborations. But over this time, we still have not managed to change the direction enough to overcome the divides. And the projection is that it's going to take us several more decades to overcome these divides. So my question to the panelists is what can we do concretely to have an exponential increase in the number of women that are actually entering the space so that we will not need to have these kind of panels. Let's give it five years. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy, for your question. Who would like to answer, please? Uh, probably, yes, uh, Ms. Sulina. I'll give it a shot. Dorothy has asked an extremely pertinent question. The answer to that on my, from my perspective, Dorothy, really is political will. We need to find the political will to do this. We need to convince the powers that be. Gender mainstreaming is an important part of policy, of regulation, and there has to be an ecosystem that has been set up in countries to be able to do that. Um, and how do we work towards political will? I think the more we talk about it, the more people will understand and be aware of the situation um, and hopefully that will snowball into something concrete but uh, as I mentioned my in my commitment for the next 10 years and it doesn't start in five years it starts it started three weeks ago three years ago perhaps you know ITU has been trying to mainstream gender policies in all countries so hopefully there will be something concrete coming out of that when I was in Malaysia the regulator the first survey that ITU sent out in the early 2000s asked how many women there were and what was the percentage of women employees in the regulatory authority and the answer was 50%, not just at the leadership level, but at all levels. And um, hopefully many countries would have that sort of um, story to tell Dorothy. I, I hope that helps. Thank you. Uh, maybe I can just give, uh, you know, supplement um, what was Celia was saying because I think she's spot on and this political will will be you know, to get the kind of scale that Dorothy mentions, I mean, it's daunting. There's no question about it. It's daunting. How do we do that? And how do we get, I mean, I was just at the W20, everyone's saying the right things, but are they going to do the right things when they have to allocate budget? But one of the things that we've been looking at, and, and it's not specific to gender, but I think it's something we could look at in this space is, you know, it, it's probably more being talked about in the environmental context. Are companies doing enough to address climate change? It's sort of, and, and so you have a, a 
an increasing focus on these environmental, social, and governance indicators, these ESG indicators in their reporting. And if investors, employees, consumers start to expect more and demand more, um, and companies report and get benefited or rewarded by doing more, I think we can we we could see see change. Uh, so we've been quite focused on this, particularly in the environmental context. But I think obviously gender and gender equality is a key part of ESG. Um, and I think you know, um, I think the more we look at how to incentivize and how we put pressure and make it a benefit of uh, something that people expect to, to happen, we we may be able to to move the needle a bit more. Thank you very much for your comment and answer. I, I hope it, was, it will be helpful. And now we are a little bit behind the schedule. For this reason, I will give the last question. I will read from our chat the last question of Fabiana Mena. Thank you very much for your question. I am Fabiana Mena from Argentina. Uh, we 20 delegate. As Anthony said, I agree that the future of innovation is intersectional. Can you share with us any program or project that reinforce indigenous women knowledge through di digital innovation? Anthony, probably you can answer. <laughs> I wish I could give a good answer for that one. It's, it's a huge challenge when we start considering the multidimensional barriers and forms of discrimination that people who hold intersectional identities face. Uh, I'm not aware of any specific programs around Indigenous persons, although it may be that the ITU is uh, working on something as of now or has got something in the pipeline It would be brilliant. But I agree that is kind of the leading edge of where we need to look forward as we kind of decolonize this space of, uh, of uh, uh, in the work that we're doing uh, in innovation and, and inclusion. So uh, it's an excellent, excellent... Um, thing to consider. Yes, because the fact that we are working on it in, with, uh, with my colleagues in W20 Communique, uh, and the fact is not only, of course, is the problem are the barriers that all this uh, group, rural women, indigenous, and so on, are facing, but it's also how we can uh, add value of all this uh, diversity of knowledge, you know, that uh, through digital, I think it is a big opportunity, not only for uh, to achieve really a, a, a real inclusion with intersectional focus, but also to um, to to improve you know, the, uh, our our own um, habits or uh, way of life. And digital inclusion is uh, a really an opportunity to achieve that. We are working on it in Argentina and in Latin America, but I'm really looking for other other experiences to 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 know more and share experiences. Thank you. Thank you, Fabiana, for your interest, for your great question and your in, engagement, <laughs> active engagement. Very briefly, I want to um, emphasize a, a really important point. The themes that you see on your screen have not been chosen randomly. Um, they're really important because, of course, they feed uh, into the overall objective of the project of promoting gender inclusive innovation ecosystem. Now, the first workshop uh, is going to be led by University of Haifa, and it's going to focus on strategic communication to promote gender equity by transla translating objectives into practice. So without diving too much into uh, this uh, uh, description, which of course you also receive at the beginning of your workshop, um, the workshop will introduce a multi-stage strategic process for implementing strategic communication to promote gender equity objectives um, within different organizational, social, and individual contexts. The second theme, as you also see from the screen, uh, will look into women's digital rights in healthcare, um, and here, um, under the guidance of University Hospital Cologne, you will be discussing strategies and solutions around the use of technology to advance um, gender equity in healthcare. And you will also discuss the correlation between digital rights, access to technology, and healthcare provision. And last but not least, um, workshop three is going to look into leveraging STI skills for gender equity 
And that workshop is going to be led by the Middle Eastern Technical University, which is uh, our third um, equals EU consortium partner for today's discussion. And that workshop is going to look into dispelling harmful gender-based stereotypes in the science, innovation, and technology field. Than uh, in workshop one, the the workshop focused on translating different objectives that people might have in their organization to promote gender equity. And what we did is we went through a process where people first defined what they care about, how they might bring that about, how they might define it in a way that's measurable and feasible. And then once they did that, they had to think about who or which group in their organization could help them achieve that change. And uh, we got some really interesting uh, discussions going about different stakeholders. And then uh, the final part of the workshop was an application of theories of behavior and predicting behavior and understanding that if you want people to help you, you need to give them a reason and reasons can look different. So it can be based on incentives, it can be based on you know, a uh, perceived benefit for the organization, for the person who can help you, a shared value, shared identity. Um, we talked about the ethical uh, aspects that you might want to take into account, issues of intersectionality. Uh, mostly, I just learned a lot about the different kind of places people work and also the different challenges that people and women in particular can have in hiring and promotion and mentoring. And um, it was great, as, as they always say, the cliche that you learn when you teach. So I learned a lot and, you know, I hope it was helpful for the other participants. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, Nikama. It sounds uh, like uh, you've reached some really important conclusions, which again, um, as a reminder to everyone, we'll ensure are captured in our final reports. Next, uh, I would like to give the floor um, to uh, Barry, uh, my, my colleague Barry from University Hospital Cologne, who is going to report on the outcomes from workshop uh, two. Very over to you, thank you. Barry, are you with us? Yes, yes. Thank you. Sorry, I was being muted. Uh, but I have to say for us, it's also a very excited meeting here. And uh, yeah, we're also happy to share with you in the following five minutes what we have we discussed. So I have to say that in the start, the digital right is actually a very fresh new topic for all of us. So, but it's also very important that uh, we start with this iceberg. We know that there are some common questions has to be covered and we hope that in our workshop, we are able to go deeper to make the icebreaker. And then we kind of start with the ice breaking. We make the brainstorming to everyone to share their stories during the pandemic. So what does the pandemic teach us concerning about to care up our woman digital right? So then we, are able, we plan to have the three breakouts, but due to time, we um, omit the first one. We focus on the number two and number three, the know-how to, to say, okay, what kind of the structures could be critical to address women's needs, you know, to improve the gender equality in the digital in the digital health, and also to discuss some actions to share the experience to promote the women's digital rights in healthcare. And also, I have to say, we are trying to using the Miro board very hardly. And as you can see, with both two questions, we're able to collect so many brilliant ideas that to not only cover the, uh, how to say, the current the focus, but also really rising, for example, uh, the mentoring program are very important, for example, for the health sector concerning the women digital right, and also concerning of different training programs, as well as uh, this start as early as possible for the primary care information to both the kids and also the families. And also concerning of the other actions we are covering was also, we are thinking, for example, the gender specific medicine, including the medical studies and also clinical trials has to be importantly considered to cover also the female patient. Yeah, so this is also something we think is important to be covered and also to include women in the low income countries, for example, to cover about ICT to improve the access for the digital healthcare. So they are really, so many things have to do. 
And uh, yeah, so we try to, I mean, in the following few months, we try to finish the report. I think it will be also very important to organize and classify what might be important and what was the priority to take actions in the future. And uh, yeah, so, so today we are using the tools. So from the information communication and technologies to try to make the integration of the digital right with the health care. And the final goal is to achieve the gender equality in the digital age. It's a very big goal, I know that, but at least today in the limit two hours, we are able to really rise up so many questions to, uh, to convince ourselves that we are truly believe that women digital rights in healthcare really matters a lot to championing the female leadership in digital age. And our uh, women's digital rights was actually staying in our hands and uh, 70 years ago, we know we can do it. And today in the digital age, we also know that we can do this. Yeah, so, so let's make actions start from now and start from here. So thank you so much. This is the workshop too. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Barry. Again, really fascinating discussions and I very much look forward to reading the report from your sessions frequently. And I see, of course, that you reached some of uh, uh, the same conclusions, of course, even though the topic of your discussion was slightly different. Um, last but not least, I would like to give the floor um, to my colleague Asuman uh, with Middle Eastern Technical University uh, for a brief report uh, from the outcomes of workshop three. Thank you. Thank you so much, Samara. Uh, for me as well, it was a great discussion and I uh, learned from uh, a lot. Um, and in five minutes, uh, it's not possible to uh, uh, transfer what I uh, learned from you, but I try to, to be precise. Uh, first of all, we already mentioned about pinpointed the main problems, uh, barriers in the in reaching the uh, career in the ICT sector. Uh, we talk about the gender stereotypes and we talk about the role of motherhood and uh, we talk about uh, geography. How does it make change uh, in terms of uh, accessing the skills as well as um, using it and uh, designing it. So uh, these are the main problems, but I would like to focus more on the solutions. Uh, what our participants have suggested, Mandarin is the first one, actually. Uh, they said that women need inspiring studies and role models to uh, get into the road to the ICT field. Uh, and the role models is really important. Maybe uh, one of the participants mentioned about their rector, uh, women rector. She, she was the first women rector and she, she, she said that she got really impressed by that. And, uh, and also it is uh, mentioned in our uh, workshop, uh, mentorship needs to be inclusive. Uh, both uh, include men and women, so they should both get mentorship in order not to create hierarchy and discrimination between men and women. This is, I think, really important. Um, so uh, skills uh, that women need Okay, it's very important, not only the technical ones, but the soft skills are really important. This is the main highlight of our workshop. Education is very crucial. Ministry of Education plays a great role uh, in this regard uh, to get women and girls into the ICT sector, but still it is really crucial to enhance uh, girls' soft skills, uh, which is not uh, easy to do uh, from my point of view as well, because uh, these are hidden gender bias and it's really difficult to tackle with them. Uh, and so for the soft skills that uh, our participants suggested like confidence, uh, self-efficacy and leadership. Again, uh, I already mentioned, but uh, role models uh, are very important and, and also uh, need to, uh, the uh, girls should be need to interact with those role mothers, with the influencers. Uh, yeah, there are structural barriers. It's not easy to go beyond, but there are some initiatives and platforms uh, trying to uh, get into the uh, sector and uh, make a transformation uh, on that. And another important thing is the language, importance of language. Uh, we, th we should resettle the vocabulary, uh, education uh, about digital literacy 
starting from the kindergarten, uh, starting from the uh, when the baby born. So uh, it's really important to change the language. And as far as I see, geography makes a big change and sector makes a big difference. Uh, in terms of getting into the ICT field and also a lack of network between uh, women uh, overlaps with the uh, lack of role models, lack of mentorship. So lastly, I would like to say public and private sectors interaction is really important. Uh, students in, um, in the academia or in the high school should be uh, really connected with the private sector uh, and uh, the gap between the two should be closed. Uh, th that's all I would like to say. Thank you. Thank you, Suman. I, I'm glad you, you highlighted the importance of public-private partnerships because we started the meeting with that and we are uh, almost concluding with that because, of course, this is the uh, objective behind the Equals Global Partnership. Um, now, cautiously, we have only five minutes left. I would like to give the floor first to my colleague, Anthony, uh, for very short concluding remarks, and then we will end with my colleague, uh, Belinda XLP. Anthony, over to you. Thank you. Yes, uh, short concluding remarks. Uh, I hear you loud and clear. Um, I just want to take a minute to, stay, to step back and uh, kind of observe how meaningful it is for us to share this space. Uh, it, we've been living through this pandemic for 18 months, and I know all of us have kind of got Zoom, like just we're, we're dead with Zoom. But it also gives us these critical opportunities to learn from one another, to connect with one another. And so I think my greatest hope is that today is a trigger for action to come. And one way that you can help take action is by checking us out on our website, equals-eu.org. You can follow us on all social media channels. Uh, we will be publishing the proceedings from this uh, colloquium very soon. And so we want you guys to have the latest, greatest knowledge on this issue uh, in your hands so you can help uh, use that to take action. Uh, and thank you again, Tamara. Thank you to each of the workshop facilitators. You are amazing. You are my role models. So I look up to you for all the work that you've done. Thank you, Anthony. Um, and last but not least, Belinda, over to you. Tamara, I'll be very brief as well. I just want to say a massive thank you to everybody who participated today. We're thrilled that we had so many people engaging with us and contributing so much to the discussions. And as Anthony mentioned, the report will be published and, and all of your contributions will be acknowledged. So, so thank you very much indeed. I'd also like to add my thanks to Tamara in particular, also to Anthony uh, and the other co-host organizations uh, today. And finally, just to say to anybody who is no, not yet a member of Equals uh, Global Partnership, now you've had a taste of the Equals EU project and you see how we, how, uh, we, we approach some of these projects please do consider joining us. Um, we have loads of projects going on and obviously you're all passionate about gender equality issues and I think there's so much you could contribute and also gain from membership of Equals. So please do visit equalsintech.org and we hope to welcome many of you, many of you soon. Thanks very much, everybody. <laughs>